All right, it's Reroll Long Sean Hannity Show. Glad you're with us. Senator Ram Paul of Kentucky is with us. Senator, how are you? Welcome back to the program. Glad you're with us. Very good, Sean. I watched the program last night. What did you uh, think? A, I thought it was a great program. I, I like having the uh, interactive conversation and trying to figure out, you know, how is it that we, you know, used to get 95 percent of the African-American vote and now we get 5 percent. You know, it's very frustrating to me, Senator. And uh, if you missed last night's show, we're going to actually do a follow up tonight on Hannity 9 Eastern on Fox. But um, I had an audience of black Americans, conservatives. And you know what's sad to me in this day and age, the names they are called, the vitriol that is that is put their way, the things that they have all collectively and individually been through just because they're black and conservative. And yet liberals are, are just their silence is deafening on the issue. Right, but I think one way around it also is is that maybe there are some issues that libertarian Republicans also might be better at appealing to than maybe some traditional Republicans have been. One of the issues I talk a lot about, and I'm going to be speaking at Howard uh, University here in, in D.C. tomorrow, is I talk about the idea that we really shouldn't be putting people in uh, jail for long sentences for nonviolent drug use. We don't need 10 and 20 year sentences where no judge is allowed to have discretion. I think that's something that appeals to people who it seems like there's been a disproportionate amount of incarceration of African Americans through our current law. Well, there's been the issue of, for example, cocaine crack versus powder cocaine that is that some people have tied to to racial penalties, et cetera. Uh, do you that agree with that? Ultimate, that problem was ultimately largely fixed, but there still is a, a big problem. And what I've been saying is that, you know, even our last three presidents all either admitted or were rumored to have used drugs as kids. And the thing is, think about how their lives would have been ruined, how they never would have grown up, been able to get good jobs or really ever become someone like the president of the United States had they been caught. So maybe we ought to rethink what we're doing to the people who don't have that kind of privilege. Do you Would you? legalize all drugs? No, what I would do is, in fact, I'm not sure I'd change any of the laws on legalization. I would change the laws on the penalties because I really don't think even the mildest of drugs like marijuana, I don't think is good for people, and I don't want to be in favor of kids using marijuana. But if young kids do use marijuana, I don't want to put them in jail with hardened criminals and lock them up and throw away the key. I want to have more local courts, more local drug courts, and more ability for the judge to show discretion. And uh, there are times when you can put someone in jail for 20 years with a mandatory sentence and no discretion by the judge under today's laws. Uh, I don't really have a problem. Here's where I've always gotten into some battles or disagreements with some of my libertarian friends. Um, although on paper, I'd love to be a libertarian. There's things I like about it. I mean, I'd love to be I'd love to put a bubble around America and isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. But the reality in my mind and heart says we can't do it, that if America doesn't lead, the vacuum is going to be filled by others. But on the case of drugs, you know, I I live in New York. I, I walk down the streets of New York, Senator, and I got to tell you something. When you see people in these crack induced states of psychosis or these people strung out on heroin, they, they would rape and rob their mothers for another fix. Um, I, I just think those are the people that need to be put away. Anybody who commits violence or threatens violence, I agree with you completely. But there are a lot of teenage kids, high school kids, and college kids who made mistakes and decided to use marijuana. And when they did, they got caught, and they get caught up in a web, or one of their friends drinks too much and overdoses. They're now in a web where if they get tried in a federal court, it could be a 20-year prison sentence without parole. I think that's an appropriate penalty, and the penalties need to be more proportional. I think other issues that, are, that can open up the Republican Party to a bigger and broader support are not disengaging from the world, not isolating ourselves from the world, but being a little more judicious, understanding that when Reagan said peace through strength, he really meant peace through strength, both of them. He didn't mean that we had to have boots on the ground every war in the world and that we always had to be involved. That maybe there's an in-between, not that we're involved nowhere, but not that we're involved everywhere, that maybe there's an in-between position that might attract more people to our party. Well, you're speaking at Howard University, a, a historically black university, and uh, well-known and, and renowned. Um, is this the message you're planning on bringing to Howard? 
Yeah, part of the message also is is that I'm going to talk about the history of the Republican Party because it's really intertwined with the black history in our country. Voting rights, emancipation, abolition, they were all hand in hand with the Republican Party. Most of the founders of the NAACP were Republican. In my home state, the most famous case that went all the way to the Supreme Court to overturn the Jim Crow laws, uh, which were uh, saying a black man couldn't sell to a white man or vice versa, was overturned by the Supreme Court was a black Republican who was the founder of the NAACP who fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. So our history is rich, and I don't think we've talked enough about Republican history. All of the first 20 African-American congressmen were Republican. There have been more African-American U.S. senators as Republicans than Democrats. That story needs to be told, and I don't think it's Why being told Why do you think enough. it hasn't been told, and how did things shift? I mean, as recently as 64 and 65, it was the Republican Party that, that worked hand-in-hand hand with Lyndon Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, how did things shift and a perception shift that somehow the Republican Party is against minorities? I think in the 30s when people are so uh, poor and so bad off, both whites and blacks, sort of chose the bigger government solution because things were so bad. And they weren't seeing – while they got voting emancipation, they weren't seeing economic emancipation. And so – it is a difficult job, but one we need to do a better job to say that, look, if you're disadvantaged and you're trying to get up the economic ladder, the better way is the Republican way. It is the way that says, you know what, if we keep running massive debts, that causes your gas prices to go up. It causes you not to be able to save. If you're on a fixed uh, income and you're a senior citizen, you can't save either because your prices are rising, all as a consequence to big government. So we need to explain it better. We need to explain that our policies will create millions of jobs. When Reagan lowered taxes, taxes and lessened regulations, we had 7% growth and created 8 million jobs. If we did that now, it would be 11 million jobs would be created if we did a Reagan-esque type of policy again. What about, but we just had Lindsey Graham on discussing this immigration bill, and it seems in many ways your trust and verify provision, although not exactly what you had proposed, is going to be a part of this final solution. Uh, where are you in terms of what you're hearing? Now, I, I, I'm cautious. Devil is in the details. No bill is written, but they, I specifically asked about it, and they specifically said that that would be in there. Well, we haven't seen any details either. My amendment, Trust But Verify, says that immigration reform only goes forward if Congress votes on and says that the border has been secured, and these votes happen each year for several years. The other thing I'm asking is that not only we secure the border, but that we secure the vote and we secure the Treasury. So if we pass out federal money for motor voter, I'm going to ask that anybody that signs up to vote be checked against the uh, immigration uh, immigration uh, registry to say, well, are you here legally, illegally, or are you here on a work visa, which means you don't uh, have the ability to vote. So there are going to have to be some rules in order to get conservatives to sign on to this. Well, the first rule has to be secure the borders first, and Lindsey Graham seemed very optimistic that that would happen. I myself find myself very cautious. I, I just don't have a history of trusting Chuck Schumer and Barack Obama. And I'm, I'm right there with you. People <laughs> still complain, and most conservatives complain from the 1980s, saying, well, we granted normalization to these folks, but then we didn't ever get to secure the border. They promised it would come later. So that's why my proposal says that you actually have to vote on it. And it's not going to be a report. What I've heard rumored from the Bipartisan Commission is they're going to have some kind of report uh, from the president, and that basically is worth the paper it's printed on, not much. So what I would say is there can be a report, and there have to be goals that have to be met. The Border Patrol, the Border Governors, everybody needs to chime in on the report, but then the vo report has to be voted on by the President, yeah, I mean, I by, like, voted on by the Congress. I like your provision. One of the things that Graham said is that this is going to go through its regular order, and that there would be an opportunity for amendments like yours to be put in and voted upon and so on and so forth. So I think at least they're going through the proper channels. We'll see. That's what uh, That's requires why Harry Reid. That requires Harry Reid to consent to amendments, and he filibusters almost every piece of legislation by yeah. not allowing any amendments. And so basically Harry Reid is the biggest obstructionist we have up here because he doesn't allow amendments on really virtually 80 percent of the uh, the bills. He hand selects a few amendments, but he they look at every ind every amendment individually, and they decide not to vote on the ones they don't like. So it's a 
little bit disingenuous of them on the gun issue to say, oh, just we should get on it. We'll let you have amendments. Well, they only give you the amendments that they agreed to, and they only vote on the bills they agreed to. So uh, we're really fighting a big battle here and trying to get Republicans to say, look, we should not go on to this bill that gives us a chance of having a rifle ban um, because it's, it's going to lead to nothing good for gun owners in America. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Generally, in principle, though, are if, if they did secure the borders and then, for example, people that are in this country illegally, some 11 million of them, and those people had to come out of the, quote, shadows and they had to report themselves and submit to a background check and learn English and wouldn't get any benefits and wouldn't even be able to apply for a green card for 20 years. Uh, I'm sorry, for 10 years. Is that something in principle you could live with? Basically, what I would like to do is to get work visas for those who are here and want to work. And if you want to work in our country, and that would mean you would be precluded from welfare, but it also means that we would have to secure the Treasury, too. So that means that if you get a work visa here, we need to require that federal money that's spent on welfare, when you go in to apply for welfare benefits, that you have to do a background check of that person by typing their name in and finding out if they're here on a work visa, because then they're ineligible for welfare. Right now, I think that doesn't happen. So there are things. We're going to have to secure the border. We're going to have to secure the Treasury. And we're going to have to secure the vote because we can't just have open borders either. So I am for reform. I'm for moving forward. But I'm not for moving forward unless we do all of these things in conjunction. Do you feel confident that will happen? I don't know yet. You know, the process hasn't started. They've they've made me doubtful because a lot of times around here, this place is run with an iron fist by Harry Reid. It's rare that amendments are offered on the floor, and usually they're pre-screened by him, and only amendments are allowed that uh, he agrees to. Uh, Moving on, uh, I did ask Senator Graham if there was any conflict with you and and Rubio and Rand uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, Mike Lee and Ted Cruz. You know, especially after John McCain, who he's very close with, referred to Ted as a wacko bird, et cetera. And uh, I think that was also targeted towards you a little bit. Um, and I think you guys are the, the hope for the conservative movement in the country, although you have some differences. But uh, are there any issues? Because there's been some criticism about you guys planning to filibuster or stop any gun control bill. I see no good to come of going on a gun control bill they will get a vote if we get onto the bill to ban certain types of rifles. I think that's a mistake. I think at the very least, even if we were able to vote down a ban on rifles, I think at the very least what's going to happen is there's going to be universal background checks, which means they'll have to have a registry up here. And we saw what happened up in New York. They publish who has a gun and who doesn't have a gun and where you live in your name. Uh, by I, I the way, think- my name was on one of those lists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you really, even if you do have a weapon, do you really want everybody to know no, where you I live would, and whether you have I, a weapon? They I come would, in prepared. I would, I'd, listen, I'd prefer to keep my private life private. I guess it's unrealistic as a public figure, but I'm, you know, I'm the least of everybody's worries. Uh, but some people, re- you know, if you're going to rob a house, you can literally, oh, this house has a gun, this house doesn't. Do I want a gun? Do I not want a gun? That's why you don't want any kind of registry. And the only way to check whether or not, if you do universal background checks, is you got to check it against some sort of registry. They're already keeping some records regionally in defiance of this law. So the ATF is thought to be keeping records in regional hubs and just not centralizing them, and that they're getting around the laws right now about having a national registry. I'm very concerned about it. You know, the way I look at it is the the Second Amendment's an important part of the Bill of Rights, and if they told me they were going to register church owners or have uh, universal background checks on people who have bad ideas, you know, bad ideas ideas have killed more people in the world than anything else. Communism, socialism, Nazism. I really don't think that, you know, if you said, well, we're going to control people and we'll get the bad people by registering bad ideas and people who have bad ideas, you know, most people would squawk, myself included, and say that goes against the First Amendment. So do you think it's going to take a filibuster to stop it all? I think our best chance would be we also have to hope that the House chimes in. I hope Republicans, though, will think long and hard about uh, standing with us and standing firm and saying, you know what, Harry Reid, if you want to pass gun control, you're going to have to have 60 votes. I think in defending the Bill of Rights, it's the least we can do is ask for 60 votes. Is it maybe a good thing to put the Democrats on record and let them vote for these bills, especially red state senators? 
The only problem with it is, is a lot of them are going to oppose the um, rifle ban, but they're going to vote for other parts of gun control. Yep. So once we get on the bill, we are going to get other forms of gun control short of the rifle ban. And many of the Democrats who want a cover vote are going to take their cover vote on the assault ban. And then what they're going to do is they're going to vote for many yep. other forms of uh, gun control, which I think are bad. All right, Senator Rand Paul, and I noticed Mitch McConnell's joining you in that, which is which is pretty interesting for the minority leader to do. Thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot, Sean. All right, a Philly man was sentenced to 144 months in prison for running.